This is Donald Ritchie. I've uh, written a couple books on Japanese film, and I did a book on Kurosawa. And what uh, I'm going to do for the next hour and a half is to give sort of an explication of Rashomon, which is certainly in the West one of the most famous Japanese films ever made. Why it became so famous will become apparent. Uh, from the very first, 1951, it won the Venice Golden Lion. It won the Academy Award for that year. It has won prizes all over and is still seen very widely and is considered as sort of a quintessential Japanese film. One of the reasons that it was is that people have always perceived it as sort of a, a mystery film, a film that you really have to think about, a film that the meaning of which is not apparent on the surface. It intrigues people. This intrigue has continued for the past half century, actually. Kurosawa himself was anxious to do this because one of the things he said about it was that the uh, source of the movie is about relative truth, but he wanted to make a film about relative reality, which is entirely different thing. As you look at this film, look at how he has made the film real. He is uh, showing us any number of realities, all of which are incompatible with each other. One of the ways that Kurosawa wanted you to appreciate this kind of reality he was showing was to show it to you through contrasts. For example, here it's raining and uh, lowering, and before very long we're going to switch to absolutely brilliant sunlight. And at the end of the film we will see this rain turn into brilliant sunlight itself, encapsulating the theme, which of course is at first you don't know anything, and then little by little you find out what things are like, the sunshine comes out and so forth. Here you come into the film Cold, and he has introduced to you uh, these characters about whom you know nothing. And the characters know nothing, I don't understand, I don't understand it at all. And they are giving you your dialogue too, as you are watching. And uh, it's only later that we learn out that one is a priest and one is a woodcutter and that they are both witnesses to these various realities that we're going to see. The single edition which was made to the original from which this picture was taken was the man who is now running for shelter under the shower. And he is called, usually in the script, he's called a commoner. But what he is, is a man who doesn't have a vocation, he doesn't work, he's not a woodcutter, and he doesn't have a vocation like a priest. And so he's in a position to ask questions. He doesn't belong to society, as it were. He is the interrogator. And without him, indeed, there wouldn't have been much story. So he's very necessary to it. There are some other changes from the two Akutagawa stories that were used, but this is the major one, and this is the, the use of this commoner and his interrogations is the way that Kurosawa and his scriptwriter, Mr. Hashimoto, were able to get the film started and to keep it completely in focus as to what is the nature of reality itself. Here he says, what's wrong with you? Meaning that you look one way and yet you've been saying something else the other. What is it you don't understand? This is the first intimation that we have of this theme about the relativity of reality. Uh, there are many other ways that these characters play against each other. You will recognize some of these if you know the rest of the Kurosawa oeuvre. The woodcutter, who is on the right-hand side looking down, is, of course, the leader of the samurai in Seven Samurai. The priest is another of the samurai, and the commoner is played by a face you'll remember from many other Kurosawa pictures. Like many directors, he liked to work with the same people over and over again. And this is one of the earliest times when he could get this nucleus of stock characters together. Here comes the theme. A man has been murdered, so his reality has been uh, stopped. And of course, the commoner being the voice of common sense is say, well, nobody worries about people like this because, you know, five or six people killed every day. The priest agreeing says, yes, there is, there is uh, things we do understand like fire, famine, earthquake, wind, plague. But on the other hand, there are some things we don't understand and I just don't understand what is happening here. So this theme of not understanding set in a environment where we don't want, know what is understanding, raining continually, we're in the midst of ruins. Uh, this sets up what it is that Kurosawa wants to tell us in this story. 
Actually, the way the story was constructed was out of two of the stories of Aktagawa Ryonosuke, who is a turn-of-the-century writer, a mannered symbolist writer that uh, doesn't have too much standing in Japan anymore, though he's sort of famous in the West taking these two stories and putting them together with several editions. The edition of the commoner we've seen, another edition, a fairly notorious one, we will see at the end of the picture, and I will tell you about it. Obviously, these are not concessions to, you know, to movies or to movie codes. This is a concession to the kind of narrative that Kurosawa wished to make this film about. He and Hashimoto were very close, although this is the, mainly the first time they worked together. They were to work together, of course, in other films, particularly Seven Samurai. They're both concerned about the same thing, uh, wishing to dramatize this. And you'll notice how we do dramatize it. We uh, have close-ups, and then we have long shots. When you have a close-up, you can empathize or think you're empathizing. But when you have a long shot, you have to draw back. It would be useful, I think, to notice the number of long shots in this picture, that be which I mean where the camera is far away from the characters, and to uh, watch how they move from far to near when they have something important to bring to us. I don't understand any of it. He's giving us a plot point here, and he's come forward in order to do so. There's a great deal of play, of geometrical play, in this film, all of which is very interesting, and one of the things which make it the masterpiece that it is. More setting up here. The rain is not going to stop for a while, and so, at that point, we finally know what gate we're standing under, Rashomon. Indeed, we look at the general desolation of the world. The world's a pretty bad place, and we're now going to find out just one example of how bad this thing is. So in the first uh, five minutes of the film, Kurosawa has screwed up our expectations, and now we start in the story within the story. We're going to see the same story now five times. Here's the first one. In this opening sequence of the first story within the story, you might want to look at how intensely real everything is. Look at that, the, the way the sunlight is glinting off the axe. Look at the interplay of shade and uh, brightness. This is one of the things that Kurosawa told his cameraman to do his very best to capture with these contrasts of things. And of course, he has several reasons for doing so. One is that it's pictorially nice. Two is that he really wanted to get you to feel the reality of this because it's going to be a reality itself that he questions. He uses all sorts of long shots, short shots. He has his entrance into the forest going on and on and on. Actually, the sequence is about nothing. It's telling us nothing at all. What it is giving us, however, is a complete uh, feeling of the environment from all sorts of angles. We were on our back there just a little bit ago looking straight up at the sky. Later on, we're going to be looking straight at the sun, which had, had I think, very rarely been done before in order to get this feeling of reality. And the reason for it, as I say, the reasons are various. One of them, the one that Kurosawa always stressed, is that he loved silent film, and he loved film that could give you the feeling of an ambience like this, which many silent films, of course, had to do. And this is particularly one thing that he wanted Rashomon to have in this opening sequence, which goes on for some time and never fails to impress everybody. But one of the reasons that he wanted to do this was, since he is going to be questioning reality itself, he has to show you everything without explaining it just like silent films do. They don't explain everything, they, they show things to you. If you follow the dialogue of this film, it will get you no place because the dialogue goes in circles. But if you follow the visuals of the film, what he is showing you, then you will come out at the end with something of an understanding, the sum total, which the parts don't add up to. The woodcutter has just discovered his first clue. That is a uh, 12th century lady's hat. We're in the 12th century, incidentally. And a lady's hat in the forest like this is not a common thing to find. Uh, having found the clue, he then looks on. You remember, this is all interior monologue. This is a story that he's telling to the others. So you're aware of the fact that he is your narrator. So now we have two narrators. We have Kurosawa and Hashimoto narrating. And within this, we have the woodcutter narrating. 
the director we have to trust, but we don't know that this is a reliable man here, he says, and the other thing that he found was this. So this is another strange object found in the forest. So wonderingly, he goes on, and again, the montage, or uh, the decoupage, which supports this, is something which is composed of all sorts of shots, short, long, far, near, in order to get this encompassing effect, this nexus of an atmosphere that he wants. Here he's found something else, rope. What could this be? So he's found a hat, he's found a dagger holder, and he's found some rope, and then he goes and finds something that looks suspiciously mixed up, considers this, and goes on further. All of this is without dialogue. All of this is shown us. And then, of course, the body. This recapitulates backwards, as it were, the entrance into the forest. This is the exit from the forest. And there he is. He is giving his deposition now. Remember, this is still within his story. He is facing the judge whom is never shown. Instead, he is speaking to us, which is indeed what he would be doing. So this movie is about our appreciation of the various realities which we create. And the judge is, is questioning this, you know, exactly what was it you saw, what was it you didn't see, and so forth. And he is recapitulating what he has uh, seen. So we have seen what happened to him, and now we're listening to his explication of it. And this is a paradigm as of the way that the film is made. First we see things as they are, and then we listen to people explaining them, or giving them their version of them. As these get further and further apart, we have to question the reality that we saw. But the problem is, we don't see anything ourselves. We see the reality that has been created by the other people, by these stories within stories. Here we now realize that also the priest, as he told us earlier under the gate, also saw something pretty strange three days ago. And now we go into his version of what he saw, and we'll begin to see the differences in these versions of what the people thought they saw. The priest now tells his story, but we are taking it for granted that we are hearing it from the priest himself since we've already seen him talking about this. In any event, what the priest sees is slightly different already from what the woodcutter sees, but one of the reasons for this is that he sees different segments of this anecdote about a murder, or a rape and a murder, which is what it's about. So he sees the protagonists going through, and we recognize the hat. This is a hat which has already been found in this film. And so these people, though we don't realize it at the time, we're seeing the main actors in the film. Then he's reinforcing this by saying that he also didn't know who they were, but now that they're dead, he can find out. You'll notice the way that this is constructed and also the way it's punctuated. Kurosawa is very fond of plain cuts, straight cuts. Uh, he doesn't use dissolves very much since they, they tend to soften things and he likes things sort of square cut and hard. The wipe, you just saw the wipe going across, that is probably the most direct kind of punctuation you can have. And here we have somebody we've never seen before. This is Tajomaru. And Tajomaru is, of course, going to be the mainspring for the anecdote. It is his actions which makes everything happen. Here we have another version of the story. The police officer, I believe that's what he is, is going down. He sees something. He goes and apprehends what turns out to be the famous bandit uh, Tajo Maru. Tajo Maru is the man who makes the story work. Without him, the anecdote would not occur. There he is. We later learn that he must have eaten something in the forest and has a stomachache. That is Toshiro Mifune in his celebrated role having a stomachache. And so we listen to the policeman saying, you know, what he found. He found the horse, and this is suspicious. Why would a bandit have a horse like that and so forth? He has already made up his mind. They all belong to the murdered man. Tajomaru is already indicating the character which you will have, which is enigmatic. 
And here he is telling you why it is enigmatic. <laughs> what he does is go from the extremes of one emotion to the other one. And it is this extremity that is very interesting about his character. When he first appeared on the screen in 1951, he surprised everybody by this, uh, this dynamic change. And usually we don't see actors have this extraordinary range, which Mifuni was uh, helped by Kurosawa to achieve in this picture. And then he goes back, as is the habit in this picture, and he tells us what happened to himself. This is how he got the stomachache, obviously, is that he was drinking polluted water. You'll notice how time jumps in this picture. Stories are interrupted by stories within stories, and eventually we get a whole Chinese box of stories. We're never confused. This is one of the things that this extraordinarily good script, Edgar Rousseau's fine direction, made certain that we're not. However, the attributions going on, look at the number of sources of information. There's two in the background, and there's one in the foreground. Who are we listening to? Who is making sense of whom? What he's talking about now is the truth. He's going to tell the truth because he knows that he's going to be killed sooner or later, so he wants to tell you the absolute truth. Of course, the truth is what we're about in this picture, and finding the truth is going to be our quest as we look at this picture. Here he has gone back in time again, and this is a celebrated sequence where he first sees the people that he's going to have the trouble with. The look of Rashomon, besides being that of the director, of course, is also that of the cinematographer. A very great one in this case, Miyagawa Kazuo, who went on to do a great number of fine films like Ugetsu, or his one film for Ozu, and so forth. In this film, he experimented a great deal. He knew that Kurosawa wanted the look of the silent film. Just as importantly, he gave a tone to the whole picture, all that flickering, the shadows against faces, Flesh, beaded sweat on flesh with dappled shadows. This is his contribution. Notice Mifune. Notice what he's doing. He's lying back like a great animal. He's scratching himself. He's blinking his eyes. He's not doing anything in particular. He is an animal. Kurosawa thought that he should look like a lion. And in fact, he'd shown some movies to his actors. Kyomachiko uh, became very frightened when she looked at Black Leopard, so he says, okay, that kind of fright. But when they came to the lion, he said to Mifuni, this is you. So in a way, what we have is a brilliant interpretation of an animal by a highly intelligent actor who is forming his character out of his own ideas on what the reality of being an animal is like. This sort of double, triple layering is fairly common in this film. It accounts for the immediacy of the impact of this kind of image. This magical moment when the shadows begin to move and we hear the Celesta on the soundtrack and he sees for the first time the attributes of the beautiful lady. This is one of the things that's written into the script and this is one of the things that in early Kurosawa that the director is most proud of. He mentions it very often, this particular sequence. You notice how it was put together? It was put together entirely visually. There's no dialogue, there's no explanation. We see what he sees. When we see the, the husband reacting, we see his reaction to the husband reacting. In other words, uh, the guard is never down in this picture. We are always looking at somebody else's idea. And here he is pulling his sword toward him because he's already made up his mind what his reality is going to be. He is uh, going to do something about that. And so here we are back at the uh, court again. You will notice the change in expression, how he is working himself up to get the judge to accept what he says happened to him. This Boxing of one story within another in this particular sequence, we're going to see him revert several times to this story, which he is either recounting or is creating. After all, he has a motivation too, because uh, he's been apprehended. And so here he continues with his story, which in a way 
is sort of like a parody of the woodcutter's entry. I mean, again, we have a lot of very short cuts to get him down to the scene of the battle, where in his version, he uh, first confronts. And of course, thanks to his character, he does it through trickery. We should start noticing now how these three principles are shown. Very often here, we have them in a triangular composition. Since it is a story of a triangle, very often the composition will be triangle. We will build up like an isosceles triangle here. And then we'll go over and we'll include her. This will be triangular. All of these various kinds of triangles will compositionally reinforce the story itself. In setting up his various compositions, he is doing this in order to forward the story. This is what compositions do. He'll break a composition. A composition is status, this thing's at rest. And then comes action, which breaks up the composition. This is, he's turned 190 degrees, then he's cut down further in order to enliven these kind of compositions, which obviously the purport of which is to indicate that the two aren't getting along very well. A triangle is irregular by its very structure and is used for troubled situations. If he wants to show a situation which isn't troubled, he'll very often use a square or he will use a, a, a circle. I mean, not just Kurosawa. Every good director realizes that composition helps to tell his story. The nervous editing of this, that one short scene after another, and Rashomon has uh, a number of short scenes in it, much more than the usual 1951 film, indicates the nervousness that he wants us to film if we simply have one scene after another plodding along. It's one thing. Here we have a very long scene from far away and it's taking its time because she is waiting. We don't have to concern ourselves with the excitement of these two men who are going to look ostensibly for buried swords, but actually it's going to lead to some kind of murder. This is a sort of a lull between storms. We see them going up now. And the fact that they are shown from far away means that we are in distance from them. We take it, an interest in their adventures as it were. We don't identify with them. They get nearer and nearer as we sense the nervousness of their plight. We don't for one instant believe what the bandit has said, although the, uh, the warrior husband apparently does. Again, these shots are so skillfully cut together that you wouldn't have guessed that we've just seen three. It looks like one to us. One of the secrets of Kurosawa's extraordinary emotional command is his editing techniques. His people who work with him call him not the best director in the world, but they call him the best editor in the world. And indeed, no one except for the Russian stuff, Shenko and so forth, have realized exactly what cutting can do. Again, fast cutting has stopped because we are, this is a moment of concentration. So it's a combination uh, in, in, in making a film which is emotionally viable, where we're being shown everything and told nothing. Therefore, the cutting, how we arrange our temporal values, and how we arrange spatial values through various compositional effects, through the various distances where we put the camera. Here we have them coming from some distance away into camera and then going away again. We get this sense of a continuous movement going on, which is fairly unsettling. And this is pretty much what the director intended. In the matter of timing, Kurosawa almost never makes a mistake. You'll notice how he's used the temporal qualities here. We have something which is leading up. Uh, these are long uh, shots. These are uh, blocks of time which we are shown. And now we're going to have to start feeling what this is going to be. Notice what happens to the length of the shot. Here we are looking at them from above as they roll around. However, this will shortly accelerate. We are not shown the outcome of this particular duel, but we are shown the effect of this particular thing. It's the effect of his story upon himself. We're shown this through a number of short scenes which have been very skillfully put together. 
There are 407 of these scenes, which is much more than you usually get in a film of this length of this period of time, 1950, 51, when it was made. The control of time, that is control of our emotional concept of time, here again we're slowing down, there's time within the cut itself, there's time within the, uh, the actor himself, there's time within the concept, obviously she's been having a long, lonely, boring time, but he's been having a very exciting one, and we'll see how Kurosawa has chosen to show us these different apprehensions of these things. Here we have what is it's quite classic. We have his gaze. We have whittled the picture down to absolutely two things and then her feeling that indeed something is going to happen and indeed something does. This all is a part of his story which we will later have to choose to disbelieve or we'll have to realize that it's his story. Again, notice her, her reactions. She turned pale and stared. Now this is going to be very, very differently recounted than the other ones. Notice too, the duels. The first duel was much daring do. They behaved like, you know, duelists do in movies. Later on, when we see a duel, it's going to be practically a parody of a duel. It depends upon, reality depends upon who is doing the telling. And he is telling us his version of it now. You remember what she looked like so innocently. Then you'll compare this later on with how she looks in yet another version of the thing. Here he is dragging her to help rescue her husband. There she loses the hat. So now we know how the cat got there. So this confusion of things leads to her finding that he has bound up the husband, so therefore we know how the first noble duel ended. And again, Kurosawa, having made this point, then backs up and holds. Then moves in for what? Psychologically interesting. Two shots, that is one person, the two, two, two. We know that it's a triangle already, and he's breaking up this triangle to show us its component parts. This is very often done, but it's not usually done this consummately. And again, he's very careful to keep shade and light consistent throughout this thing. This picture was taken in an actual forest. There's no setting at all, though they cut down a few trees to let the sunlight in. There's only two sets. The gate we have seen, and also the court scene we have seen. The consistency of the emotional effect, the consistency of the action, is one of the very things which makes us question it. When we look at her as she is now, and in 10 minutes we'll remember her as she was and now as we're looking at her, we'll have to be able to accommodate all sorts of versions of reality because each scene has been very carefully put together to look equally real, one compared with the other. Once when Kurosawa was asked what Rashomon was about, he smiled and said, well, it's about this rape. He wasn't being cynical, he was being funny. But it is, it's about a rape and about a murder. And the way in which the rape in this version, which is the viewpoint of the aggressor, is given, is plainly heroic. I mean, she bites him as heroines do in this sort of situation. And uh, he responds like many people who are telling conventional stories do. He goes in for the kill and so forth. She knows what's going to happen. I think one of the reasons that he chose to do it in this it's sort of time-honored romantic manner is that he is going to uh, show us that this indeed probably was not what happened. He never shows us what happened because one of the points is that we will never know what happened. Again, this sort of uh, playful aggression has been seen on, in the film many, many times. So he makes sort of a scherzo out of this before the actual rape is consummated. In one of the versions, of course, it's not consummated at all. So there are all sorts of loose ends that we can play around with. Most movies want to tie up all the ends. This one wants to take an ending that you think is an ending and loosen it. 
Again, we expect to understand exactly that how humiliated the husband is and how pleased the raper is. This is not about uh, man and woman. It's about the relations of two men. He's taking the chattel of another. Here is both what she sees and also the famous shot of the sun through the foliage onto her face is indicating the reality which is now fading as it slowly goes out of focus, as her eyes are slowly shut, as she drops the phallic dagger which plunges into the ground and as she, in his version, begins to respond uh, wholeheartedly to his attentions. And there is his reaction to his own story, childlike. He is so pleased, he's so proud, and he did it without killing the husband, and he had made the husband look, and uh, so he's real macho himself. But then, in other words, having told us and the judge what he did with the, uh, the woman, then he's having taken what he wanted and uh, having showed the husband who was the better man, it is the wife who says, oh, no, no, she couldn't live without you know, her shame. She's behaving in a very conventional manner. This whole idea of this noble duel, as contrasted to the parody duel, which will come later on, is done in the style of many, many Japanese films which insist upon duels and so forth. These are, are choreographed. Indeed, the only way to do a sword fight, I suppose, is choreographed. But the ways of choreographing are quite different. When you see dueling in American and European films, the, the choreography of the steps themselves and the choreography of the camera is quite different from in the Japanese film. Here we have a triangle which shows exactly what it is that he is, we think, going to do. In point of fact, he is not going to kill him. He is going to loosen his bonds. Uh, this also is something which is, we see this in the heroic kind, of the serious kind of uh, Japanese sword films, which in a way, this is not exactly making a parody of it, but it's using everything that the Japanese Chambara films, that is the films about sword play, use, the elaborate choreography. They had a sword master while they were making this particular film, and he would instruct them as how they should move according to the classical art of swordmanship. Of course, Seven Samurai is the picture which gives uh, probably the best idea of what that is like. But all of the sword fight films are done in the choreographical style of not so much Japanese reality as Japanese films. There's a long history of ways in which these are filmed and ways in which the people act. And here we see many examples where uh, one rushes off past the camera, away from the camera, using the camera as though it itself is one of the principles in the, the sword fight. Then these long uh, waits, a uh, seven samurai is, is quite detailed in this matter. Close-ups seen as though from the point of view of the other one. All of this melange put together to make the feeling of violence, the feeling of a sword fight, the impression, as it were, of a sword fight, because this film, of course, is an impression of these various recantations of the tale that we are seeing. Mifuni is playing the sort of slightly buffoonish character, which very often is shown against the heroic character. Again, this is a known quotient in period films. And again, there's always a barrier that they have to go round and round and round and round. This is a, a vocabulary which people know. And then the husband falls. Notice where he falls and notice how he falls. We will later on see the same scene over again, done in from an entirely different point of view, in which the whole thing is an absolute parody of this heroic business that we have seen. And so in a fit of fury, and because he is such a macho guy, he killed the man, he tells the judge. I wanted to kill him honestly, again justifying himself. We get an idea of what's going on here, that people use reality to justify their actions. 
Oh, that is indeed one of the main points of the film, is that they're not lying. They're really believing what they're saying. He really believes what he has just <laughs> interpreted for he was on with the magistrate. In so doing, he got so carried away, he completely forgot about the woman. But, of course, our husband, he has to pick this up. Again, we see that his story is being heard by the woodcutter. Since we never see Tajimura, you know, has died by the time the story opens. So this is all second hand, third hand, fourth hand, fifth hand. So we have to explicate in our minds as we're watching it, these levels. And it is this, the, the intellectual puzzle of the thing which has added a great deal to its popularity and also to the mystery that surrounds it. People still say, not just the producer, people still say, oh, it's a marvelous film, but I have no idea what it's about. But as you watch it, it becomes very apparent what it's about. It's about the nature of reality, the most serious theme that any director can make his films about. It's had a great deal of influence. Many, many directors have been, Robe Grier, for example, in, in, in writing last year, Marie Mbound, Ellen René, and doing that particular film, have talked about Rashomon. <laughs> We are now back in the present time. If anyone could be seen as a spokesperson for Kurosawa in this film, it might be the priest. For one thing, the priest is an optimist. He is also a sentimentalist, which is certainly not out of place in a priest, although it might be in a film director. He expresses also at the same time a general acceptance of everything. It is he who says, well, the world's like that, and so on and so forth. I suggest that he might be a spokesman for Kurosawa because he is a man of the median. He is one who is in between these things. Anybody who could have understood the questioning of reality that goes on in Rashomon, it wouldn't be the woodcutter, it certainly wouldn't be the commoner, it wouldn't be the three people in the anecdote. It could only be the priest. So by default, if Kurosawa does have such a a spokesman, and I do believe that most directors do have spokesmen in all of their films, I know that Kurosawa does, then I think in this case it would, it would be the priest. Here is a major theme, it's a lie. They're all lies. Everybody is lying. And the philosophical theme of the picture, men are men, they can only lie, that's all that they can do. They can't tell the truth even to themselves. Having said exactly what he means, Kurosawa and his writer now have the characters think about this and then give various reasons for this, just as you expect. This is the priest's reason for the extraordinary variation of the stories that we're seeing. Again, we have common sense here. Lying's okay as long as it can be interesting. And now he wants to go further. They want to find out what is going to happen. And indeed, hers is completely different from what the bandit story is, which is something we might expect, because now we have learned not only that everybody lies, but that everybody has to lie. In other words, we don't have any other way of communication except through lies, because our versions of reality are in themselves only versions. Therefore, they are lies. In other words, reality is not to be pinned down. We are not to discover what it is. Another layer of reality we have to consider in this film is that the people who are commenting project themselves. I mean, he's a priest, so he feels compassion. He feels sorry for, which is exactly what a priest would do. If he were somebody else, like a bandit, he would rape her. In other words, what their expectation of another person's reality is has to be taken into account when we're assessing the reality of the stories that we're seeing and the astonishing fact that they don't coincide because they are different realities. Here, obviously, she has seen something entirely differently from this. She is a much put upon woman, and this is the idea of the reality of a much put upon woman. This is what she saw. You'll notice that what she's saying is quite different from what Tajomaru has told us. She is now remembering. And again, I mean, she is, the focus is entirely different. She's thinking of the husband or says that she's thinking of the husband. 
We will later be given reasons to think that she, her version is again not a trustworthy one. Uh, she goes to some length of this, and you realize that the writers and the Kurosawa are d doing this for a reason. They are intensifying character by playing upon our expectations, just as the priest gave us the kind of character we expect him to have. Now we have the women who is giving us the kind of character that a conventional woman would do if she were conventionally recounting what happened to her. Notice Tajomaru is not, is not so heroic anymore. He's a monkey. He's running away from his triumph. He's obviously already raped her, but in this version, he hasn't killed anybody. There's a period of stasis now, after all this excitement. He and she alone, and we know the consequences of this. The triangle is broken, and she is casting herself as a conventional heroine in a Japanese story. And so her reactions now are conventional ones, because what she's going to encounter when they see each other is what happens to ladies who have been raped in costume pictures. You'll notice the skill with which this particular actress, this is Kyo Machiko, in which she is able to play on these various levels and to make us slightly conscious that she, as an actress, knows what it is that is false about the conventional image. Notice the extravagance of her gestures, particularly where she will now turn and look into his eyes and what she discovers there, and the horror, the incomprehension which Kyomachiko brings to this role, which suddenly makes a conventional figure become real to us because it's something that we ourselves did not expect, and indeed she has exactly the same features when we go back and she looks at us as though we were the magistrate. So she tells us what we just saw, but tells it with a real expression. And then she goes into explaining what it was that we saw explaining it from her point of view, what she saw, no longer as a conventional person, but as a person who believes much more strongly in her own version of reality than conventionality usually insists upon. This is told us nakedly, without makeup, as it were, and then we revert back to just the same expression. What has happened in this little bridge is that we start believing in her. We don't believe in her. She's just a doll that they toss around for a you know, while until this sequence. And then we believe in her. You'll notice that the belief that we have depends not so much upon the story, since we are learning now to disbelieve all the stories, but to believe the actuality of the person that we are looking at. Later on, we're going to really start believing the bandit as well and start believing the husband, who also has a different tale to tell. And it is this, these levels of believability that are so expertly put together in this picture. Even a conventional gesture such as this is lent a kind of dignity by the, the multiplicity of choices that were given over what they, this is a very conventional gesture that she is allowing herself. <laughs> Recognize that tune? This is not the composer's fault. This is Kurosawa's fault. Kurosawa is a tin air, and he, he knows, you know, the 100 best film classics, and that's all he knows. And during this film, he asked his composer, Hayakawa Fumio, who's a very respected and extremely, you know, talented composer he was, give me something like the Bolero, Ravel's Bolero. And the poor flustered composer would try, you know, several things at some distance. And so we have what amounts to the Bolero. This is unfortunate. So far as Japan is concerned, it doesn't seem in Congress to them that the famous French orchestral work would be used, but it seems very un un Congress to us. If we notice it too much, it spoils our appreciation of the picture by inserting a layer of reality, which is truly one that the director didn't intend. Again, she retreats into conventionality, but given the skill with which this is presented by everybody involved, we do start thinking that maybe people under these circumstances would really sort of act like that. 
camera movement, uh, when things move toward a camera, when they move in order to show the effect, she's looking that way because of the way that he's looking at her, and she cannot stand this. The look of a husband to a wife who has just had the misfortune to have been raped is a part of classical Japanese dramaturgy. All husbands are supposed to be very cynical at that point. It's as though, you know, his, his possession has been muddied or something. He starts to blame the woman. I mean, I don't think this happens in life, but this happens on the stage a lot. So he is blaming her for what happened. For the victim to be blamed is, of course, known in all societies, but in Japan it's very well known. And indeed, a lot of dramaturgy hangs upon this, and it drives people to desperate measures. This is driving her to a desperate measure, the effects of which we will see. So, negatively, don't look at me like this means that positively I am going to do something that I am now telling you about. The influence of Rashomon has been uh, long and, and fairly fruitful. It has, uh, in other countries, has sort of spawned an adjective, which is Rashomon-esque. And people say that narratives are like Rashomon, where we have a, a multiplicity of plot strands going on simultaneously. In actuality, I mean, that, that kind of construction was certainly practiced before Kurosawa did it, and I'm sure that Kurosawa, being a great film fan, had seen a number of European pictures which had used multi-strands, a very often conflicting ones, and probably had them firmly in mind when he made Rashomon. Nonetheless, a contribution has been made in that in the West it is now very common to call a picture or a novel or something like Rashomon. This usually means that it's confusing and highly entertaining and involved and somewhat like a murder mystery. And of course, the movie's all those things. Overcome by what she has been experiencing, again, she raises her face in this way that she has, and then she gives her version of this reality, which we're getting familiar with, but we're not getting to understand much more about. But each version gives it a verisimilitude, which grows so much so that we don't question plot developments. For example, she's saying that she must have killed him, but she doesn't remember. One of the reasons she doesn't remember, because if she would re remember, we would have too concrete a plot point. We don't want that. We want to leave it much more open. It's much more convenient for the director to have her not remember, to rather remember that she was there, she was standing by the pond and we're shown it, really. I mean, this is, you know, this is what she really thinks it is. She tried to kill herself to, uh, it's because this is what perhaps her late husband, if indeed she did kill him, wanted that, but she could not do it. Again, she has retreated into conventionality. Look at that pose. You've seen it a hundred times. This is very skillfully, it's coming out and becoming real and then turning into conventional poses. All of the characters do this. And if you know Japanese iconography, it becomes even more startling how Kurosawa is able to control the reality of the image that he is presenting us to question reality itself. <laughs> Again, we are back at the alternate setting. There are two settings, of course, I believe I mentioned. There's this setting, which we're running continually. And then there's a court setting in which it is sort of indeterminate light. Then at the end, it's going to be sunlight. And so these two ways of looking at our storytelling thing, of course, is a reflection of the kind of values. Is it true? Is it false? Is it black? Is it white? Now we're going to be introduced to another way of communication. They're recapitulating. You know, women, he says, can fool themselves. He doesn't say that men can do this too, but they obviously do because we've seen this happening. But according to the husband's story, there is another source of information. And this is through a shamaness. This is through a medium. This is how the dead can also contribute their version of reality. Again, it's the woodcutter who has witnessed this. 
He is going to tell how this is. This idea of shamanists being in control, their guardians through the gates to the kingdom of the dead. This is true in all cultures, but particularly in Asian cultures. Japan still has a sort of shamanist tradition in the Shinto religion. They're fairly common even in Korea, unless they're suppressed entirely. You won't find them in China too, I dare say. And so there is a way of reaching the other dimension of reality, which is the dimension of the dead. And so this is what the commenter says. Lightning strikes, obviously, something occult is going on. We see a roof tile which has fallen, which is obviously demonic, and this cuts to the shaman going into her act. This is how she puts herself into a trance. Again, we notice a kind of triangular relationship in that the two witnesses are again in this scene. They witness almost everything. And Kurosawa insists that we notice that they're there. And so now the, the dead man's spirit has entered the shamanist and she speaks. This is another of the magical moments in Rashomon. To hear Mori Masiki's voice coming out of Miss Homer's lips is a magical thing. And because, like the uh, sound of the Celesta, when we first saw Kyomachiko's sandaled feet, this is what sound can do to image. As I've said, I mean, Rashomon is mainly about images, but how sound can alter image is also one of the tools that Kurosawa uses over and again in his career. And this is used very persuasively because, of course, as we know, the dead do not speak. The dead are dead. And the very fact that we are given the dead man's version of this would fly against common sense. But of course, common sense has no place in this picture because if we're going to talk about reality, then anybody's reality is as good as anybody else's reality. One is not privileged. So therefore, what a dead man says is just as much as valid as what a live man or a woman says. And so in this version, even though it is the voice of the dead, we are invited to accept it. And we do, because it has always been prepared for us that this any version of reality is going to be shown us is going to be accepted by us for evaluation or for not. Here we are looping up to a part of the story that we already know, the gaze of the husband, on well, this case, the husband is not looking at the wronged wife. He is looking at something worse. He's looking at the wife saying to the bandit, take me away, I've been raped successfully, and I'm now lust only for you. And again, here we have another red herring. This is one of the reasons why he's not there, of course, is he's dead. And so he's giving you an alternate version as to what happened. Those many critics who say that Kurosawa doesn't know how to understand women, doesn't know how to photograph them, doesn't know how to interest himself in them, might very well look at Rashomon, because in Rashomon we get a fully formed woman with all of her similarities and all of her differences. He was to do this once again. He doesn't do it very often, that's true, but in No Regrets for Our Youth, we have a full-length portrait. And in this picture, we have sort of a another kind of portrait. This was made several years after that picture. Again, we are shown a woman on her own terms. This is fairly rare in Kurosawa. It is rare enough that people have indeed often commented upon the fact that its films are, you know, by men, for men. That the men would be shocked by this, by a woman saying this sort of thing, again, is a sort of an icon of respectability. This is very conventional of the men to believe this. 
to be shocked at this sign of woman's liberation, as it were. I mean, she's obviously her own person, and she knows what she wants. I mean, we could find that admirable, I suppose. Obviously, Tajo Maro does not find it this way, and he stomps off and leaves her. The husband also spurns her, so therefore nobody wants her. And this is what a woman gets for speaking. Her mind is one of the unspoken assumptions of this particular sequence. I don't believe that Hashimoto or Kurosawa actually actively, you know, considered this, but this is the way that it appears. Again, we have the gaze. Much is made of the gaze in this picture, how people look at each other. And this one would expect in a picture in which we are shown things rather than told them. What happens next is one of the true mysteries of Rashomon because we never completely are given to understand who it is that kills the husband. I mean, suicide is quite possible. He could somehow do it. Who, who kills him? Who found the dagger? This is what we're supposed to ask ourselves at the end of the picture. The utter hopelessness of this, of the man's situation, is very well shown by the acting of Mori Masayuki, who plays the husband. When this film came out in 51, Mori was by far the best known. Mifuni was absolutely unknown. Akio Machiko was sort of a sex box who was given her first major chance to act, but Mori Masayuki had been on the stage, he'd done Hamlet, and he'd done all sorts of things, and he was one of Japan's finest actors. He was a star. He brings to his part a somewhat stage-like, studied reaction. You can compare his acting style with that of Mifune. Those critics, mainly abroad, who said, oh, this is kabuki acting, of course, could not be wrong. It has nothing to do with the kabuki. What it has to do is with measured dramatic action, as, you know, acting, the art of acting, as seen on the stage, and also going beyond that, going into sort of an expressionist kind of acting, which is what Mifuni sort of patented in this picture. Again, looking up in this picture always indicates nature, always indicates a pause where you think what things are like, where you really are, who you really are. And here he does a surprising thing for a nobleman. He is thinking about dying. He is afraid. He cries. But this is not elucidated. This is one of the sections which we don't see again. And what occurs remains something like a mystery. <laughs> again, we know that the dagger is uh, involved in this. And so I want you to follow the adventures of the dagger and what happens to the dagger. Because the dagger is a plot point. And what happens to the dagger, it makes possible the kind of reactions that we have to this picture. Mm -hmm. All of these things, the dagger is real. There's the dagger, see it? It's sword, actually how this permeates throughout the picture is of major interest to anybody who's trying to untangle the great Rashomon murder mystery. As I've indicated, there is no mystery at all. All the stories can really be reconciled if you realize that the realities were different for everybody involved. Again, from close up to long shot, always indicating detachment a moving back in order to see the whole picture, in order to avoid the specificity of a close-up. Beautiful, 
crosscut there where she follows his actions and she follows the story as she has told it. And so we think that we know what happened to the dagger, that he killed himself, at least that is what he says he did. But he's not done speaking yet from the land of the dead. There's something else he wants to tell us. And this is what it felt like after he was dead. And you notice who's looking at her so closely, just as though he might be afraid of what she's going to say. This is very carefully composed. Gertha has made certain that the woodcutter listens to everything. The woodcutter does not indicate, does not betray, does not uh, show at all what he might be thinking and might be feeling. But we're going to see that he is going to be unmasked as an untrustworthy narrator before very long. And so who could it be? Whose hand could it be that grasped the dagger and drew it out? This, of course, the corpse doesn't know because he's dead already. This, the medium doesn't know because she only knows what the corpse knows. We don't even look at her, and then there he is, alone on the screen, blinking, just as though he had answered our question. So now we are back again. They have heard these stories. Who has told them this? Well, the woodcutter himself obviously has told them. Maybe the priest has. Probably the woodcutter has told every story so far. He's pacing back and forth. Then he questions apparently what he himself it's as though he's making a new version of reality, having given us one. He's now doing another. You saw the look that the commoner gave. The role of the commoner here is very interesting. He was put in because without him, the plot doesn't move. He is the one who has to doubt and has to make the others prove what it is that they're saying. He is also the voice of common sense as against a higher voice, which is what, of course, I was arguing for in this picture. So now he thinks he's on to something to find out what the mystery is because he says that he doesn't, he doesn't believe what he's been told, nor do we at this point. And he is putting in his dialogue, in his voice, everything that we have begun to understand. We've seen the woodcutter around. And there's a lot of holes in this. And indeed, the woodcutter's actions are uh, indicative of a kind of guilt, if you want to call it that, this is uh, very well exemplified in the acting style of Shimura Takashi, who plays the woodcutter. Uh, you, of course, are familiar with him in later things, the leader of the samurai, for example, in Seven Samurai, as uh, Watanabe Kanji in uh, Ikiru. And he plays diffidence better than almost any Japanese actor I know, an indecision. And he's able to show, in his face, which is so important on this film, a degree of honest contrition, even though he may be, you know, he may be guilty in, his, in Scandal, for example, the Kurosawa film, he has a very important role where he has to do these two or three motions at one time, so he knows how to do this. And this is what he's doing now. He's apparently sort of telling us the truth. He's being grilled. But again, it's not, it couldn't be. He's only telling us his version, a further version, a new version of reality. And so just like the uh, prosecuting attorney, the commoner is saying, okay, then we'll go back again. Now you said this, now what happened? What really happened? But of course we don't know what really happened. All we get is another version. Now, this version is interesting because it is leading up to the next duel. And the next duel is so completely different from the one that went before that the choreography is the same, but the, the import is entirely different. A picture this controlled where the, the performances are this controlled both by the director and by the actors themselves means that different tones are involved. Look at the difference in Mifuni's actions now. He's like a schoolboy asking for for favors, even the way he, he sits like a child. Obviously, a change of tone is coming up. Uh, the reasons for the tone will become apparent in a few minutes. 
But uh, the, the fact that the tone of the actor is being used is one of the delights of this picture. Uh, we were able to see sides of the actor, as it were, that you usually don't see because in the West particularly, a consistence of character is one of the things deemed desirable. And here we're being shown all sorts of wild inconsistencies. And here he is, you know, saying the same thing he said earlier, but saying them like a child, overacting, big close-ups, beaded brow. He's deliberately becoming a ham actor. And there are reasons for this. Also, he's doing being very, very conventional. I've just raped you, be my wife. That is a very conventional kind of uh, thought. Again, she also has changed tone. Her tone now is, having gotten out of conventionality, is how could I, a woman, answer a question like that, which is, I think, nothing a woman, a real woman would say. But we need to have that sort of thing because she is going to organize the next fight. And obviously she has reasons for doing this, but Kurosawa has his reasons too. He has shown you an heroic battle. And now he wants to show you what he really thinks about fighting. You could go through the works of Kurosawa and find that he doesn't really believe in, her in heroism as such. And some of his finest films, like uh, Yojibo and Sanjiro, are about heroism exposed. There isn't any such thing. We all, all we have is people in desperation, uh, which is something that Mifune is showing on his face right now. But being a... Uh, a man of fiction at this point, he is going to go through with it. And so we're going to get a parody of, of the nobility that we saw before. We're now going to see it before and after. This is the way that fighting really is. And we'll see how they scramble around and so forth. Right now, they're leading up to it, and they're in a very, very conventional matter. You shameless horror is something we hear on the stage a good deal in Japan. Uh, why don't you kill yourself? This is another line which is fed women. And then we have the noblesse oblige, where each tries to give her to the other, and where she's full of vilified. This vilification of the woman doesn't have much dramatic reason, but it has, uh, I think for reasons of tone, it's probably important. After all, this is, you know, what, the 10th century, and uh, women were regarded as chattel. And so to show this, and at the same time to make a very definite indication that we're behaving conventionally in one hand and unconventionally on the other opens up a rift in the picture into which the spectator is supposed to fall in trying to find out what this picture is about. Such large close-ups cut from close-up to close-up as caricatures. This indicates that the tone that the that the sequence takes and its difference from the other parts of the film. <laughs> the preamble is very long, but then you begin to realize how it is. Look at how how's that for a triangle? We've got a triangle within a triangle. And the way that the fight is choreographed insists upon triangularity and this is echoed, of course, by all the other triangles we've seen, the triangles under the gate, for example, of those three. We have two sets of three. We have the people under the gate, we have the people in the forest. And each are treated as unstable triangles. This is particularly an unstable one, and we will later see what it is that uh, is going to resolve it. This is uh, the moment when the parody starts. Uh, she becomes quite hysterical. Uh, she plays the role of the mad woman, which is a, a favorite role of conventional dramaturgy. And again, she speaks as not a figure, not a chattel, not something that men think women are, but what women, such as a woman herself, might actually feel about these two jerks who have been fighting over her. She is reviling them. Also, in looking particularly at this sequence, we have to remember that we are looking at the second version that the woodcutter has told us. In other words, he's told us one version that is completely different from this, and now he's changed his mind, he's telling this 
parodic version. He is obviously has his reasons for doing it. But Kurosawa also has his reasons for doing this. One of them is to cast even further doubts upon the woodcutter. And the other one is to make fun. Look at me, Funi, there. He's like a child. This is this kind of culpability that you see on the Japanese classical stage is a, a known thing. And this is what they're doing. Also, the passiveness of the husband. This is Nimaime action. And now she has goaded them into a sword fight, which is as different as possible from the one that we saw. She delights in it because she has thus created it. Thus, in a way, she has come back to the way a woman perhaps actually would be. But again, we only have the woodcutter's version of this and Kurosawa's version of what the woodcutter's version is. Notice carefully the overacting. The eyes too wide, looking back and forth. Notice how fear is suggested. These are our uh, louts. These are not the heroic men that we saw before. This is, in a way, her version of it, but it's also the woodcutter's version of, of it, and it's also Kurosawa's version of the woodcutter's version. shot very conventionally, as though he's aware of the conventions that he is making fun of in this sequence. You've seen that scene a hundred times where the two swords come out from either side of the frame, and then much falling down and uh, much getting up again. Actors are allowed to express themselves to a ludicrous degree. This could be a silent film because everything that she feels is is written, everything he feels is written on their faces in no other way. And the director's intentions become more and more clear as we go into this sort of Keystone Cops version of the original duel. Again, the way it's filmed, Full frontal, moving camera, moving backward, the actors moving forward, absolutely conventional. This is the way that Chambara is filmed. And of course, I doesn't like Chambara because Chambara is romanticized warfare and he likes real warfare. And so in a picture like uh, The Hidden Fortress, he makes glorious fun. Here's that, our favorite shot again. He makes glorious fun of the conventions of Chambara and how different they are from real reality. This sort of scene where the two men rolling around become practically indistinguishable. This is, uh, I mean, each of them is so messed up, they look like each other even. This he was to use, he used uh, earlier in Stray Dog, when the, the hero and the villain were uh, rendered indistinguishable from each other. He did it again in High and Low at the end, where they are fused. He likes to take presumed opposites and to bring them together. Here, he first allows one to get on the top and one to get on the other. I, I've often wondered why he went to such length in this sequence. This is a very long sequence, given its purport, given what it, it ends up being. I think the sheer excessiveness of it is one of the things he wanted to impress upon us, that uh, this is how entertaining sword films really look. On the other hand, real life is something else. You'll notice another cliché here. He lost his sword by having it stuck in the uh, stump of the tree. There are many Chambara sword fight conventions here. This kind of painful crawling around is one of them. Having lost the sword by having it stuck too strongly into the stump of a tree, that is another one. There's almost none of the conventions that he uh, doesn't use here. Now we have, again, you remember that particular bush that the samurai fell into? Well, here we have the same bush. 
And it's exactly the same location, but look how differently it is shown. You remember we saw him backing into doing the heroic fight. Now in this paradistic, but nonetheless actual fight, we have him again backing into it. This sudden realization that we are watching the same place where we saw the thing before really heightens our feeling of the believability of both versions at the same time. There's the famous sword that got stuck in the tree. The slowness, the inevitability of it, and at the same time, the, the fragileness of Mifune's bandit is all quite something which the director fully intends because he knows that now we have begun to recognize this copse into which our hero is backed. And we are able to compare the heroic with the paradistic. And in this final moment, we're also going to have another mystery solved. How did the bandit die? Now we know. Or we think we know. We've now had two or three versions of how the man could have died. When Rashomon became such a well-known phenomenon in the Western world and became the most famous Japanese film in other countries, a kind of belief was built up that it owed its eminence to being recognized by the West, and that indeed in Japan it had not been recognized. Well, this is not true. If you look at what films brought in money in Japan, out of the 500 or so films which were made in 1950, Rashomon, I think, was number 10. It had its critics, of course, but it was not a failure. It made money for Daiei. What would seem to indicate the fact that Japanese didn't appreciate it was that it hadn't been chosen for the festivals. Japan was brand new at the festival business, and, and Venice had said that it wanted a picture, and they had no idea what it sent, so they didn't send anything. And it was the manageress of uh, Italia Film who saw this and said, that this is a very nice picture, it should be shown. And so it was Italy that invited Japan to show this particular picture. Japan was extremely surprised because this picture had not been made for foreigners. And there's an old Japanese canard that if the something is not made specifically or for a foreigner that is Japanese, then there's no hope that the foreigner would ever understand what this is. And so all of a sudden, something which they considered in very Japanese had won worldwide acclaim. The film had already been successful. It would probably have been remembered by critics. So the fact that you know the West discovered the film, I'm sorry to say that's not true. No more questions of close-ups now. We, we see Mifuni's back. We don't see his face anymore. Husband's gone. He's gone. The whole anecdote has fallen apart. There's no hope for a triangle. At this point, he would probably get the horse if it's still around. And then we go drink the water and get the stomach ache, and we'd be back where we are again. That was not shown. Very, very cleverly not shown. We don't see the body this time. We simply see the uh, sword retrieved, and then we see the final exit of the bandit. Change of composition. Our first diagonal. We haven't had a diagonal so far. Diagonals used by Kurosawa always mean that something is changing. We've had triangles and we'll continue to have minor triangles, but now we're on to something else. Obviously a conclusion is necessary. We've heard the uh, five stories and indeed they haven't been reconciled. And they have all have reasons for, these men give reasons for they're not being reconciled, but we are thinking about this in a different kind of way. The diagonals, the way that people are positioned with each other is slightly different. We're having very sudden pans, which we haven't had before. We have uh, suggestions, like that pillar is in between the woodcutter on the other and the other two people who are questioning him, which is uh, symbolic, perhaps, of this, this kind of misunderstanding or his isolation or the fact that he's a liar. Again, a diagonal in the background. These diagonals are very important to Kurosawa. Now 
one of his best films, The uh, Lower Depths, has many, many diagonals which are used to suggest changing opinions, something happening, another diagonal in the background. This is not accidental. Any director who is worth his salt thinks about things like this, knowing perfectly well that composition can forward meaning. Now we come to another plot point. A baby has been discovered. And of course, the commoner, common sense himself, is stealing the clothes from the baby. So this is so much for common sense in this existential film. The baby is not in the original. The baby was added, and it was really added after the uh, script as such was finished. It was felt that the script was so bleak that some sort of uplift, some sort of optimism, perhaps, was necessary. In looking at Kurosawa, one feels, except in the last two or three films, that there is always hope somehow. He's always very careful about the idea that if things aren't really quite as bad, perhaps, as he's painted them, that there's still some sort of uh, thing to hope for. And so, in a, in a film as early as Rashomon, he makes a very bold statement, and in the very face of likelihood and Akutagawa, he brings in the famous abandoned baby. That said, he does pull it off. <laughs> In the context of watching this film for the first time, we don't question that baby. I think we question the baby only after we've seen the film a couple of times because innocent babies are a little bit too facile a symbol for a film of this complexity. We expect a film of this complexity to offer us, if we're going to get a symbol, it ought to be a symbol that is as complicated as it itself is, and everybody is used to babies who are abandoned and then get saved. Uh, Japanese critics, for example, have often said this about Rashomon, and Kurosawa has been presented with this. He's always defended it, and of course he does it so well that he could very easily offend it. But he couldn't have perhaps defended so well as this great symbolism at the end, which is going to occur. You will notice the rain. He makes certain that we notice the rain. The rain is a part of it, and has come to symbolize sort of the awfulness in which we are all forced to live. That rain was so difficult to make, they had to get the fire departments from Kyoto, and then it wasn't visible, so they had to put black ink in the rain, and it streaks the actors, as you can see. He wanted it to rain so much, because at the end he wanted a symbolic stroke, which was that the sun should come out. Now this, like the baby, is a symbol which can be so trite that it could, you know, ruin things. Again, it is carried off with a consummate panache. Uh, so again, we do not question this, nor do, nor do we question all the conventional emotions that we are seeing at this point. We realize that, this, that these are being used because they are hastening us to an inevitable conclusion. And this conclusion is based upon the findings that we cannot believe any of the stories and we cannot believe reality. And so we cannot believe that the reality that these people are creating for themselves. <laughs> now here, if in these matters of punctuation, we have him doing something he's never done before Kurosawa in this picture. You, you just saw it dissolve. Heretofore, it's been wipes or cuts, and we just dissolved. Here's another one. He's dissolving. Why is he dissolving? He's dissolving because he's changing the mood, because a dissolve, it means something elegiac. It means things coming together and not things coming apart, as in the case of the wipe. And sure enough, something is happening. Notice the rain. The rain is lessening. We have then a new way of telling a story for the first time in which softening effects are even courted, the dissolves, and in which drama is resolved. The rain stops, the sun comes up. Just a little Philip at the end, are you trying to take what the little baby has and leave him start naked? No, no, he says. And then he says, 
that he's really a good man, that he has these kids, but one more won't make any difference. Then we wonder, is this the man who's been lying to us all the time? Would a man who would do this be a man who's, who could maybe stab another man to get the dagger? What is this? We, we, we have no consistency. And one of the glories of this film is that in the very fact that we have no consistency, we have a great affirmation at the end. And the affirmation is completely symbolic. We have the baby, which is a symbol. We have the son, which is a symbol. These are great affirmations. They're great because we look at them, we can see them, we're not told about them. We're told something else in this film. Maybe he's ashamed, for example, because maybe he did do the things we are strongly suspecting that he did, but it suddenly doesn't make any difference. The priest who should concern himself with this sort of thing doesn't make any difference to him. He's also caught up in the great affirmation of things going on as they must, of, despite the fact that we cannot trust our own reality, let alone we still have faith, and this word is very important to Kurosawa, and it's never been more important than in this film. If you have faith, and again, then we're given a token of this faith in the notorious baby, and then we're ready for the final transformation of the end in which Everything that we have seen is questioned and affirmed. This affirmation is one of the things that makes Russia want a great film. I don't think any other director could have made this. I can think of other ways that, you know, Bunuel or Bergman or somebody would have made it, but to nakedly affirm in the very face of things which make you doubt is a heroic action. And that, I think, is one of the things which makes, in last analysis, Rashomon to be a heroic film. <laughs>